Welcome to the first episode of my new Untold Legends sub-series. Let's call it the Tales series. I mentioned it was coming in my Resident Evil Story Chapter 1 video, but just to get a bit more detailed as to what this is, it originally started solely as an idea to read novels, sort of like an audiobook series, but now the idea has grown to include all types of smaller side content, including printed media like comics and manga, random non-canon content. This Caliban Co. video is going to be an audiobook style experience with some light editing covering a story that takes place between the events of the original Resident Evil and Resident Evil 2. I'm going to use this series to cover stories from other properties as well, like Predator Demon's Gold, which was a short comic and a magazine, and my Star Wars timeline content has found a new home here where it just fits better. They're going to be rebranded and integrated into this Tales playlist also. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce you to my friends over at Into the AM, who were kind enough to sponsor this video. I hate wearing boring clothing, and if you've been watching my content for a while, you know I like my clothing bright, colorful, creative. My wardrobe's filled with graphic tees. Into the AM nails that look and feel. Since 2012, they've been creating premium apparel that elevates self-expression while being extremely comfortable. The material of these shirts is thin and breathable, always keeping me as cool as possible considering I live in a very warm state. Here's five shirts that I personally selected. Cosmic Beats, a neon boombox with colorful ooze and planets taking a dip, Abyss, another space-themed one with an astronaut falling into a void, Cyber Cafe. It's a cool, futuristic city, but not just that. There's a little cat there. I'm not a big cat person myself, but it does remind me of the game Stray, and that's a great game. Night District, you can never go wrong with Japanese neon-lit streets, and Defender, with an added Samurai Warrior on it. Into the AM is running a great bundle deal for their graphic tees, three for $60. If you're interested, use the link in my description and check them out. And that also gets you an additional 10% off your purchase. You get some cool clothing, a nice discount, and it goes a long way into supporting this channel. Let me know which designs are your favorite in the pinned comment below. Now let's begin with Resident Evil Caliban Cove. Raccoon Times, July 24th, 1998. Spencer Mansion destroyed an explosive fire. At approximately 2 a.m. Thursday morning, Victory Lake District residents were awakened by an explosive blast that thundered through Northwest Raccoon Forest, apparently caused by a fire that swept through the abandoned Spencer Mansion and ignited chemicals stored in the basement. Due to delays from the police barricade set up at the forest perimeter in connection with the recent string of murders in Raccoon City, local firefighters were unable to salvage any part of the estate's grounds. After a three-hour battle against the raging fire, the 31-year-old mansion and an adjacent servants' quarters were deemed a complete loss. Built by Lord Oswald Spencer, European aristocrat and one of the founders of the worldwide pharmaceutical company Umbrella Incorporated. The estate was designed by award-winning architect George Trevor as a guest house for Umbrella VIPs and was closed down shortly after completion for reasons unknown. According to Amanda Whitney, spokesperson for the Umbrella Corporation, parts of the estate were still being used to store a number of industrial cleaning agents and solvents used by Umbrella. Whitney said in a statement yesterday that the company would take full responsibility for the unfortunate incident, calling it a serious oversight on our part. Those chemicals should have been cleared out of the Spencer house a long time ago, and we're just thankful that no one was hurt. At this point, the cause of the fire is undetermined, but Whitney went on to say that Umbrella will be bringing in their own investigators to sift through the ruins in hopes of determining the fire's point of origin. Raccoon Weekly, July 29, 1998 Stars taken off murder investigation. In a surprising announcement by city officials at a press conference yesterday, the Raccoon City branch of the Special Tactics and Rescue Squad was officially removed from the investigation into the nine brutal murders and five disappearances of city residents that have occurred in the last 10 weeks. City Council member Edward Weist delivered the statement, citing gross incompetence as the primary reason for the Stars' removal. Readers may remember that the Star's first action upon being assigned the cases last week was to search the northwest area of the forest for the alleged cannibal killers. Weiss stated that it was because of their blatantly unprofessional conduct that their mission ended in disaster, resulting in the crash of a helicopter and the loss of six of their 11 team members, including the Star's branch commander, Captain Albert Wesker. After Star's mishandling of the Raccoon Forest search, said Weist, We've decided to let the RPD see this investigation through to its conclusion. 
We have reason to believe that the stars may have been ingesting drugs and or alcohol prior to their search and have suspended the use of their services indefinitely. Weist was joined by Sarah Jacobson, representing Mayor Harris, and Police Commissioner J.C. Washington to make the announcement and answer questions. Neither Police Chief Brian Irons nor any of the surviving stars could be reached for comment. Cityside, August 3, 1998. Source of a state fire deemed accidental. After an exhaustive investigation by fire officials working with Umbrella's Industrial Services Division, the fire that ravaged the company-owned Spencer Estate in Raccoon Forest late last month was determined to have been caused by carelessness on the part of person or persons unknown, as was announced in a press conference yesterday. Said ISD team leader David Bischoff, It looks like somebody tried to start a campfire in one of the mansion's rooms, and things just got out of control. We found nothing to suggest arson or foul play of any kind. He went on to say that while the destruction of the property was total, there's no evidence that anyone was caught in the fire or a subsequent explosion. Chief Brian Irons of the Raccoon City Police Department was in attendance at the conference, and when asked whether he believed the fire to be connected to the unsolved murders and disappearances plaguing the city, Irons stated that there was no way to be sure. Said Irons, At this point, anything I could say would only be speculation. Though I will say that the fact that the murders have stopped since the night of the fire seems to imply that perhaps the killers were hiding there. We can only hope that they've now left the area and will soon be apprehended. Chief Irons refused to comment on the allegations of gross misconduct by the Stars in their brief assignment to the murder investigation, saying only that he agreed with the City Council's decision and disciplinary actions are being considered. Rebecca Chambers rode her mountain bike through the dark, winding streets of the Cider District, the late summer moon swelling in the warm, clear night sky overhead. Although it was relatively early, the suburban streets were deserted. The citywide curfew still in effect. No one under 18 was supposed to be out after dusk until the murderers were caught and put safely behind bars. It had been a tense and quiet summer in Raccoon City, at least on the surface. She glided past silent houses, the faint glow of television sets spilling out across well-kept lawns the distant drone of crickets, and an occasional barking dog, the only sounds in the air that whipped past her. The uneasy citizens of Raccoon dwelled behind those locked doors, waiting for the announcement that the killers had been apprehended, and that their city was safe. If only they knew. For just a moment, Rebecca envied them their ignorance. She'd come to the rather disheartening conclusion in the last couple of weeks that knowing the truth wasn't all it was cracked up to be, particularly when no one believed it. It had been a long, merciless 13 days since the nightmare at the Spencer estate. The surviving stars had escaped treachery and death just to run up against a massive brick wall of scornful disbelief when they tried to tell their tale. Jill, Chris, and Barry, and herself had been labeled drug addicts and worse in the local papers, undoubtedly at Umbrella's urging, and after their suspension, even the RPD had refused to believe them. Now with Umbrella taking over the investigation of the fire, undoubtedly getting rid of the last of the evidence, it was as if everywhere the stars had turned, Umbrella had been there first, greasing palms and covering tracks, making it impossible to get anyone to listen to their story. Not that it would have been that simple anyway. One of the biggest, most respectable med research and pharmaceutical companies in the world, not to mention the primary source of income in Raccoon City, conducting bioweapons research in a secret lab creating experimental monsters. If I didn't know better, I'd probably think I was crazy too. At least the absolute worst was over. With the lab destroyed, the attacks on Raccoon had stopped, and though the people responsible hadn't been held accountable yet, she figured it was only a matter of time. Umbrella was experimenting with dangerous stuff, and wouldn't be able to hide it from a star's investigation. She and the others just had to watch their backs until the home office sent back up. Speaking of, ouch, the pancake holster was poking into her ribcage. Rebecca adjusted it through the thin cotton of her shirt, hoping that after tonight, she wouldn't have to carry the weapon anymore a snub-nosed 38 revolver from Barry's collection. She couldn't speak for the others, but she hadn't had a decent night's sleep since they'd escaped the Spencer estate, and walking around armed all the time wasn't her idea of safe. Sighing inwardly, she took a left on Foster and pedaled through the shadows toward Barry's house, reminding herself that he'd probably called the meeting because he'd heard from the home office with orders. He would only say that there had been a development and to show up ASAP, and though she was trying not to let her imagination run away with her, she couldn't help the steady pulse of excitement that had knotted her stomach since he'd called. 
Maybe they'll fly us to New York to brief the investigation team, or even to Europe for when they storm Umbrella's headquarters. Wherever they were sent, it had to be better than staying in Raccoon. The strain of looking over their shoulders had been getting to all of them. Chris seemed to think that Umbrella was waiting until the public eye was off the stars before making their move. Though it was only a theory, and not exactly the most reassuring thought to fall asleep by, Chicken Heart Vickers had skipped out of town after only two days, unable to take the pressure. And although Jill, Chris, and Barry had condemned Brad's cowardice, Rebecca was starting to wonder if maybe the Alpha pilot didn't have the right idea. It wasn't that she wanted Umbrella to walk, there was no question their experiments were morally reprehensible and certainly illegal. But until the star sent help, staying in Raccoon City was dangerous. Not after tonight, just a little longer, and this will all be over. No more guns, no more locked doors, no more worrying about what Umbrella will do to us for knowing the truth. When they'd first made the report, their superiors in New York had told them to stay put. Assistant Director Kurtz himself had promised to do some investigating and get back to them. But it had been 11 days, and still no word. She had no intention of running away as Brad had done, but she'd come to hate the feeling of that holster, the weight of the deadly steel against her side every waking moment of every day. She was supposed to be a chemist for Christ's sake, and once the reinforcements come, maybe they'll move me to one of the labs, let me study the virus. Technically, I'm still a Bravo, there's no way they'd want me on the front lines. There was no question that it would be the best use of her talents. The others were experienced soldiers, but Rebecca had only been with the stars for five weeks. Her first mission had been the one to Raccoon Forest that had wiped out over half the team and clued the rest of them into Umbrella's secret. Since then, she'd spent a long time brushing up on the molecular architecture of viruses, trying to determine the T-virus replication strategy. The stars didn't need field medics right now, they needed scientists. And if she'd learned anything from the Spencer Estate disaster, it was that she belonged in a lab. She'd held her own that night, but she also knew that working with the T-Virus was the greatest contribution she could make towards stopping Umbrella. And you may as well face it, her mind whispered. You're fascinated by it. The chance to study an unclassified emerging mutagen to find out what makes it tick? That's what makes you tick. Yeah, well, there was no shame in enjoying her work. She joined the stars in hopes of just an opportunity, and with any luck, after tonight's meeting, she would be packing a bag and getting the hell out of Raccoon City, heading into a new phase of her life as a star's biochemist. She pulled to a stop at the end of the block in front of a huge two-story remodeled Victorian, painted a pale yellow, checking all around for anything suspicious before getting off her bike. The Burtons lived next to a sprawling suburban park, heavy with trees. Even a few weeks ago, she might have wandered through the silent park, enjoying the balmy summer night, looking at the stars. Now it was just one more dark place for someone to hide. Shivering slightly in spite of the warm, humid air, she hurried up the front walk. Dragging her bike into the porch, she wiped sweat from the back of her neck and checked her watch. She'd made excellent time, only 20 minutes since Barry's call. Rebecca leaned the bicycle against the railing, praying that he had good news. Before she could knock, Barry opened the door, dressed in a t-shirt and jeans, his heavily muscled body filling the door's frame. Barry lifted weights, with a vengeance. He smiled and stood back to let her inside, taking a quick look out at the quiet street before following her into the front hall. His Colt Python was tucked into a hip holster, making him look like an overgrown cowboy. You see anybody? He asked lightly. She shook her head. No. I took back streets too. Barry nodded, and though he was still smiling a little, she could see the haunted look in his eyes, the look he'd had ever since their narrow escape. She wished she could tell him that nobody blamed him, but knew it wouldn't make a difference. Barry still held himself responsible for a lot of what happened at the estate that night. He looked as though he was losing weight too, though she figured that it had more to do with him missing his wife and kids. He'd sent them out of town immediately following the incident, terrified for their safety. Just one more way that Umbrella has damaged our lives. He led her through the spacious hallway past the stairs, the walls decorated with framed drawings and crayon that his daughters had made. The Burton house was rambling and spacious, filled with scuffed and well-worn furnishings that epitomized family. Chris and Jill should be here anytime. You want some coffee? He seemed tense, scruffing nervously at a short red beard. No thanks, maybe some water. Yeah sure, go ahead and introduce yourself, I'll be back in a minute. He hurried off to the kitchen before she could ask him if anything was wrong. Introduce myself? What's going on? She walked through the hall's arched opening into the cluttered, comfortable living room and stopped, a little startled to see a strange man sitting in one of the recliners. He stood up as she entered the room, smiling, but she could see by the way his dark gaze narrowed slightly that he was sizing her up. Even a few weeks ago, the careful scrutiny would have made her horribly self-conscious. She was the youngest STARS member ever to be accepted for active duty and knew that she looked it, but if anything positive had come from the incident at the Umbrella Lab, it was that she no longer cared much about things like social embarrassment. 
Facing down a house full of monsters tended to put things in perspective that way. Besides which, being stared at, I'd gotten pretty routine since then. She gazed back at him impassively, studying him in return. Jeans, nice shirt, running shoes. He also wore a hip holster with a 9mm Beretta, the star standard issue sidearm. He was tall, maybe a full foot over her 5 foot 3 inch frame, but slender with a physique like a swimmer's. He was almost movie star handsome, a high weathered brow, and finely chiseled features, short, dark hair, and a piercing gaze that sparkled with intelligence. You must be Rebecca Chambers, he said. He had a British accent, his words clipped and somehow polished. You're the biochemist, is that right? Rebecca nodded, working on it. And you are? He smiled wider, shaking his head. Forgive my manners, please. I hadn't expected. That is, I... He stepped around Barry's low coffee table and extended his hand, flushing slightly. I'm David Trapp, with the Star's Exeter branch in Maine, he said. Rebecca felt cool relief wash over her. The Star's had sent help instead of calling. Fine by her, she shook his hand, stifling a grin, knowing that her appearance had thrown him. Nobody expected an 18-year-old scientist, and while she'd gotten used to the surprise looks, she still took a mischievous pleasure at catching people off guard. So, are you like the scout or something? She asked. Mr. Trapp frowned. Sorry? For the investigation, are there other teams already here, or did you come to check things out first, get the dirt on Umbrella? She trailed off as he shook his head slowly, almost sadly, his dark eyes glittering with an emotion she couldn't read. It came out in his voice, heavy with frustrated anger, and as the words sank in, Rebecca felt her knees go watery with a sudden anxious dread. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Miss Chambers. I have reason to believe that Umbrella has gotten to key members of the stars, either by bribery or blackmail. There is no investigation, and no one else is coming. A look of confused terror passed through the girl's light brown eyes, and just as quickly was gone. She took a deep breath and blew it out. Are you sure? I mean, did Umbrella try to get to you, or are you positive? David shook his head. I'm not absolutely certain, no, but I wouldn't be here if I wasn't concerned about it. It was a bit of an understatement, but David still wasn't past the shock of seeing how young she was, and felt an honest, instinctive desire not to alarm her any further. Barry had mentioned that she was something of a child genius, but he hadn't really expected a child. The biochemist wore high tops and cut-off denim shorts rolled at the knee, topped by a shapeless black shirt. Get past it. This child may be the only scientist we have left. The thought rekindled the anger that had been burning in David's gut for the past few days. The story that had been unfolding since Barry's call wasn't a pretty one, filled with treachery and lies, and the fact that the stars, his stars, were involved. Barry walked into the room with a glass of water, and Rebecca took it from him gratefully, swallowing half of it in one gulp. Barry shot him a glance and then turned his attention to Rebecca. He told you, huh? The girl nodded. Do Jill and Chris know? Not yet. That's why I called, Barry said. Look, no point in going through this twice. We should wait for them to show up before we get into specifics. Agreed, David said. He generally found that first impressions were the most telling, and if they were going to be working together, he wanted to get a feeling for the girl's character. The three of them sat, and Barry started to tell Rebecca how he and David had met back in Star's training when they were both much younger men. Barry told a good story, even if it was only to kill time. David listened with half an ear as Barry related an anecdote about their graduation night. Involving a rather humorless drill sergeant and several rubber snakes, the girl was relaxing, even enjoying the story of their childish prank. Seventeen years ago, she would have been celebrating her first birthday. Still, she had put her questions on hold at Barry's request, even though David knew she had to be anxious about what he told her. The ability to retrain one's focus so quickly was an admirable trait, one that he'd never fully mastered. He'd been able to think of little else since his own call those stars AD. David's devotion to the organization had made the apparent betrayal all the more bitter, like a bad taste in his mouth that wouldn't go away. The stars had been David's life for almost 20 years, had given him all the things he'd lacked growing up, a sense of self-worth, a sense of purpose and integrity, and just like that, the lives of dedicated men and women, my life and life's work simply tossed aside as if it meant nothing. How much did that cost? How much did Umbrella have to pay to buy the star's honor? David shook the anger, focusing his attention on Rebecca, if all he'd learned was true, time was short and their resources were now severely limited. His motivations weren't as important right now as hers. He could tell by the way she held herself that she wasn't the shy or submissive type, and she was obviously bright. Her eyes fairly sparkled with it. From what Barry had told him, she'd acted professionally throughout the Spencer facility operation, 
Her file suggested that she was more than qualified to work with a chemical virus, assuming that she was as good as the report said, and assuming she has any desire to put her life in further danger. That was going to be the sticking point. She hadn't been with the stars for very long, and knowing that they'd sold their people out probably wasn't going to overwhelm her with feelings of confidence for the job ahead. It would be just as easy for her to step out of the game now. For that matter, it would be the intelligent choice for all of them. There was a knock at the door, presumably the other two alphas. David's hand drifted down to the butt of his 9mm as Barry went to answer. When he walked back in leading the Stars team members, David relaxed, then stood up to be formally introduced. Jill Valentine, Chris Redfield, this is Captain David Trapp, military strategist for the main Stars Exeter branch. Chris was the marksman, if David remembered correctly, and Jill, something of a covert B&E specialist. Barry said that the pilot, Brad Vickers, had skipped town shortly after the Spencer incident. No great loss, from what he could gather, the man sounded distinctly unreliable. He shook hands with both of them and they all sat down, Barry nodding toward him. David's an old comrade of mine. We worked together on the same team for about two years, right after boot camp. He showed up on my doorstep about an hour ago with news, and I didn't think it could wait. David? David cleared his throat, trying to focus on the significant facts. After a pause, he began at the beginning. As you already know, six days ago, Barry placed several calls to various Star's branches to see if any word had come from the home office about the tragedy that occurred here. I received one of those calls. It was the first I'd heard about it, and I've since found out that the New York office hasn't contacted anyone about your discovery. No warnings or memos. Nothing has been issued to the Star's regarding the Umbrella Corporation. Chris and Jill exchanged looks of concern. Maybe they're not done investigating, Chris said slowly. David shook his head. I spoke to the assistant director myself the day after Barry called. I didn't tell him about the contact, only that I'd heard rumor of a problem in Raccoon, and wanted to know if it had any merit. He looked at the assembled group and sighed inwardly, feeling like he'd already gone over it a thousand times. Only in my mind, searching for another answer, and there isn't one. The AD wouldn't tell me anything outright, he continued, and he told me that I should remain quiet about it until official word came down. What he would say was that there had been a helicopter crash in Raccoon City, and what he implied was that the surviving stars were trying to lay blame on Umbrella, angry over some sort of funding dispute. But that's not true, Jill said. We were investigating the murders and found, yes, Barry told me, David interrupted. You found that the murders were the result of a laboratory accident. The T-virus that Umbrella was experimenting with was released somehow, and it transformed the researchers into mad killers. That's exactly what happened, Chris said. I know it sounds nuts, but we were there. We saw them. David nodded. I believe you. I have to admit, I was skeptical after speaking with Barry. As you say, it sounds nuts. But my call to New York and what's happened since has changed all of that. I've known Barry for a long time, and I knew that he wouldn't be looking to place blame for such an unfortunate incident unless Umbrella was, in fact, responsible. He even told me about his own unwilling involvement in the attempted cover-up. But if Tom Kurtz told you that there was no conspiracy, Chris said, David sighed. Yes, we have to assume that either our own organization has been misled, or that, like your Captain Wesker, members of the stars are now working for Umbrella. There was a moment of shocked silence as they absorbed the information, and David could see anger and confusion play across their faces. He knew how they felt. It meant that the stars' directors had either been manipulated by Umbrella or corrupted by them. And either way, the survivors of the raccoon team had been hung out to dry, left vulnerable to whatever Umbrella might do. God, if only I could believe that was all a mistake. Three days ago, I picked up a tail on my way into work, he said softly. I wasn't able to make them, but I'm assuming that they're some of Umbrella's people and that my call to New York was responsible. Have you tried to get a hold of Palmieri? Jill asked. David nodded. The star's national commander was the one man he knew was above taking bribes. Marco Palmieri had been with the stars since the very beginning. I was informed by his secretary that he's leading a classified operation in the Middle East and won't be available for months. And word has it that arrangements are being made for his retirement while he's away. You think Umbrella's behind it? Chris asked. David shrugged. Umbrella has made substantial donations to the stars over the years, which means they have the contacts. If they're trying to turn their stars away from investigating them, getting rid of Dr. Palmieri would be to their advantage. David glanced around the room, trying to assess their readiness for the rest of it. Barry's fists were clenched, and he stared at them as if he'd never seen them before. Jill and Rebecca both seemed lost in thought, though he could see that they had accepted his story as truth. It would save them some time at least. Chris stood up and started to pace his youthful features flushed with anger. 
So basically, we've got no credibility with the locals. No backup coming and we've been branded as liars by our own people. The Umbrella investigation's dead and we're screwed. Does that pretty much sum it up? David could see that the anger wasn't directed at him, just as the anger that he felt wasn't for the young Alpha. The thought of what Umbrella had done, what the stars were involved in, it made him sick with rage, with feelings of helplessness that he hadn't felt since his childhood. Stop thinking of yourself, tell them the rest. David stood up and looked at Chris. Though he addressed all of them, he hadn't even had time to tell Barry yet. Actually, there's more. It seems that there's another Umbrella facility on the main coast, conducting experiments with this virus of theirs. And just like what happened here, they've lost control. David turned to Rebecca, taking in her wide, horrified gaze as he finished. I'm taking a team in without Star's authorization, and I want you to come with us. They all stared at David, Chris feeling like he'd just been punched in the gut. He was still reeling from the information about the stars from the realization that they were on their own, and now, another lab. Andy wants to take Rebecca. David went on, his dark gaze still fixed on the young Bravo. I've talked to the people on my team I believe to be trustworthy, and three of them have agreed to go. So I'm not going to lie to you, it will be dangerous, and without the stars to back us up, there's no guarantee we'll be able to close the lab down. We just want to go in, collect some solid evidence on this T-virus, and get back out before anyone knows we're... Before he can stop himself, Chris interrupted. I'm going to. We all go, Barry said firmly. Jill nodded, putting her arm around Rebecca. The team seemed flustered, her cheeks red, and looking at her, Chris was once again reminded of Claire. It was more than just a physical resemblance. Rebecca had the same wit, the same spirited blend of courage and thoughtfulness that Chris's younger sister had. And since the Spencer estate disaster, Chris had come to feel just as protective of Rebecca. Too many of his friends had died already. Joseph, Richard, Kenneth, Forrest, and Rico. Not to mention Billy Rabbitson. His body had never been found, but Chris had no doubts that Umbrella had killed him to keep him from talking. It wasn't that Rebecca couldn't handle herself, but damn it, she's part of our team. No way she goes without us. David shook his head. Look, this isn't a full-scale op. Five people is already stretching it. Rebecca's got the background we need to find the data on the virus, and she already knows what symptoms to look for. You've got your team right here, Chris said. You can take us instead. Let your guys look into the cover-up. David sat back down and looked at Chris, his face expressionless. Tell me who's involved in Umbrella's conspiracy to hide their research, he said. Chris glanced at the others, then back at David, determined not to let his confusion show. We suspect several people locally. Umbrella's office workers, of course, the police commissioner, Chief Irons, a couple of his men. David nodded. And now that it looks like the stars are in on this, what do you propose to do? Where the hell is he going with this? Chris sighed. I don't know, I... We should contact the feds. Maybe an internal affairs division to look into the stars and the RPD. Barry cut in, and we'll get in touch with some of the other stars branches. There are still good people working out there. We ain't gonna be too happy Umbrella's taken over. David nodded again. So you agree that Umbrella has to be stopped, even though it will be dangerous? Well, no shit, Chris said, scowling angrily. We can't just sit around and do nothing. There's no telling what can happen if the T-Virus gets out again. Well, no shit, Chris said, scowling angrily. We can't just sit around and do nothing. There's no telling what can happen if the T-Virus gets out again. And what can you tell me about the classification of the virus? David asked quietly. Chris opened his mouth to answer, and then closed it, staring at David thoughtfully. I was about to say you should ask Rebecca, and he knows it. David stood up and looked at all of them in turn as he spoke, his voice intense and determined. I agree. Umbrella has to be stopped. But let's not kid ourselves. We're talking about breaking from the stars and going up against a multi-billion dollar establishment on our own. Nowhere is going to be safe. And our only chance for success is if we each do what we can, what we're good at, to take Umbrella down. He fixed his cool gaze on Chris, as if he realized that Chris was the one who had to be convinced. You and Jill and Barry already know what to look for here, and you've been with the stars longer than Rebecca. You should stay here, out of sight. See if you can ferret out the connection between the local police and Umbrella, and reach out to the stars members that you think would help us. David turned to Rebecca again, and if you agree, I think we should leave Vermaine tonight. With the information I have, it looks as though things have already gotten out of hand. My team's standing by, we can go in tomorrow at dusk. The room was silent for a moment, the only sound that of the ceiling fan whirring overhead. 
Chris still felt angry, but couldn't find a hole in the man's logic. He was right about their options. And whether Chris liked it or not, the choice to go to Maine was Rebecca's to make. What information do you have? Jill asked thoughtfully. How'd you find out about the lab? David reached down to a battered briefcase propped next to his chair and dug through it, pulling out a file folder. An interesting story in itself, if a strange one. I was hoping that one of you might be able to decipher some of this. He laid out three sheets of paper on the coffee table as he spoke. What looked like photocopies of newspaper clippings and a simple diagram. Shortly after I talked to the home office, I received a visit from a stranger, a man who claimed to be a friend of the stars. He told me his name was Trent and gave me these. Trent! Jill broke in excitedly. She turned to Chris, her eyes wide, and Chris felt his heart skip a beat. He'd almost forgotten about their mysterious benefactor. The guy who told Jill to watch out for traitors, who told Brad where to pick us up. David stared at Jill, his expression puzzled. You know him? Just before we went in to rescue the Bravos, a man named Trent gave me some information about the Spencer estate and warned me about Wesker, Jill said. He was quite a piece of work, real shady. He didn't give anything away, you know, but he knew what was going on with Umbrella, and what he did tell me all panned out. Barry nodded, and Brad Vickers said that Trent called in the state's coordinates right after Wesker activated the triggering system. If he hadn't radioed, we would have blown up with the rest of the mansion. Chris suddenly realized that he had a serious headache brewing as they all gathered around Barry's coffee table, staring down at the papers. The stars were working for Umbrella, there was another T-Virus facility operating in Maine, and now Trent again, popping up like some cryptic fairy godmother. His motive's impossible to guess at. It was like some kind of a game, the stakes all or nothing as they struggled to get to the bottom of Umbrella's conspiracy. And we have no choice but to play, but whose game are we playing, and what do we risk losing if we fail? Chris shot an unhappy glance at Rebecca, thinking again of his kid sister, and wishing, not for the first time, that they'd never heard of Umbrella. David watched them study the information that Trent had given him, somehow not surprised that the enigmatic stranger had contacted the stars before. The man had been a professional, though at what precisely? David couldn't imagine. Why would he want to help us fight Umbrella? What's in it for him? David thought back to the brief encounter he'd had only five days ago, searching his memory for some additional clues. Something he'd missed. He'd arrived home late from work, and it'd been raining. Pouring, a thundering summer storm that beat at the windows and masked the sound of his gentle knocking. The Exeter stars had enjoyed an easy summer. More paperwork than action. The Bravos had taken off for a criminal profiling seminar in New Hampshire, and David had been entertaining thoughts of packing a bag and attending the final days until he'd received Barry's call, followed by his first hint from the home office that something was wrong. He'd spent the next day calling a few of his branch contacts with discreet questions and digging through files on Umbrella, not making it home until almost midnight. The driving rain had ushered him into his cold, dark house, the atmosphere matching his mood perfectly. He'd poured a scotch and collapsed on the couch, his head spinning from the implications of what he'd learned, that either his old friend Barry was lying or that the AD for the stars was. The rapping at his door was so soft that he missed it at first, the steady rain hammering on the roof covering the sound. Then it grew louder. Frowning, David looked at his watch and walked slowly to the door, wondering who the hell came calling in the middle of the night. He lived alone and had no family. It had to be work, or maybe someone with car trouble. He cracked the door open and saw a man in a black trench coat standing on his porch, streams of water running down his lined face. The stranger smiled, an open, friendly expression, his eyes glittering bright with humor. David took in the man at a glance, tall and thin, maybe a few years past David's age, say 42 or 43. His dark hair was plastered to his skull by the rain, and he held a large vanilla envelope in one gloved hand. Yes? The man grinned wider. My name's Trent, and this is for you. He held out the damp envelope, and David glanced at it warily, not sure if he should take it. Mr. Trent didn't seem dangerous, or at least not threatening, but he was still a stranger, and David preferred to know the people he accepted gifts from. Do I know you? David asked. Trent shook his head, his smile unwavering. No. But I know you, Mr. Trap, and I also know what you're about to go up against. Believe me, you're gonna need all the help you can get. I don't know what you're talking about. Perhaps you have me confused with someone else. Trent's smile faded as he extended the envelope, his dark eyes narrowing slowly. Trent's smile faded as he extended the envelope, his dark eyes narrowing slightly. Mr. Trap, it's raining, and this is for you. Confused and not a little irritated, David opened the door wider to accept the envelope. As soon as he grasped it, Trent turned and started to walk away. Hold on a moment. Trent ignored him, disappearing into the rain-drenched shadows around the side of the house. David stood in the doorway, uncertainly, 
holding the damp paper and staring into the pouring darkness for another minute before going back inside. Once he'd studied the contents, he wished he'd gone after Trent. By then, of course, it was too late. Too late and only too obvious what he'd meant. He knew about Umbrella and the stars, but who does he work for and why did he choose to contact me? Jill and Rebecca were studying the map while Barry and Chris worked through the copy newspaper articles. There were four of them, all recent, all centered around the tiny coastal town of Caliban Cove, Maine. Three of them concerned the disappearances of local fishermen, all presumed dead. The fourth was a rather humorous piece about the ghost that haunted the cove. It seemed that several townspeople had heard strange sounds floating across the waters late at night, described as the cries of the damned. The writer of the article had laughingly suggested that the witnesses to the phenomena should probably stop drinking their mouthwash before bed. Funny, unless you know what we know about Umbrella. The map was of the stretch of coast just south of the small town, an aerial sketch of the cove itself. David had uncovered a few facts about the area on a visit to Exeter's library, uncomfortable using the star's computer after Barry's call. The rather isolated stretch had been privately owned for several years, bought up by an anonymous group. There was a defunct lighthouse on the northern rim of the inlet, sitting atop a cliff that was supposedly riddled with sea caves. Trent's map showed several structures behind and below the lighthouse, leading down to a small pier on the southern tip of the open crescent. There was a notched border that ran the length of the cove on the inland side, presumably a fence. Caliban Cove was written across the top in bold letters. In smaller type just beneath were the words UMB, Research and Testing. The third piece of paper that Trent had given him was the one that David didn't understand. There was a short list of names at the top, seven in all. Lyle Ammon, Alan Kinnison, Tom Athens, Louise Thurman, Nicholas Griffith, William Birkin, Tiffany Chin. Just under it was a somewhat poetic list of sorts, set into the center of the page in curling font. Jill picked it up again and was reading it carefully. She looked up at David, a half-smile on her face. No question that we've got the same Trent here, the guys in the riddles. Any idea what it means? David asked. Jill sighed heavily. Well, one of the names here was in the material that Trent gave me, William Birkin. We figured out that at least some of the others were researchers at the Spencer facility, so I'm willing to bet these people also work for Umbrella. Birkin may not have been at the estate when it was destroyed. I don't recognize any of the others. David nodded. I checked all of them with the STARS database and came up blank. The rest, though, is it a riddle of some sort? Jill glanced back at the paper, frowning as she read it to herself again. Ammon's message received. Blue series. Enter answer for key. Letters and numbers reverse. Time rainbow. Don't count. Blue to access. Rebecca took the paper from her as Jill looked back at David thoughtfully. A lot of what Trent gave me seemed like random stuff, but some of it related to the Spencer Mansion secrets. The whole place was rigged with puzzle locks and traps. Maybe this is the same deal. It relates to something you'll find. Oh shit. They all turned to Rebecca who was staring at the top of the page, her face drained of color. She looked at David with an expression of anxious despair. Nicholas Griffith is on this list. David nodded. You know who he is? She looked around at all of them, her young face openly distressed. Yeah, except I thought he was dead. He was one of the greats, one of the most brilliant men ever to work in the biosciences. She turned back to David, her gaze heavy with dread. If he's with Umbrella, we've got a lot more to worry about than the T-Virus getting out. He's a genius in the field of molecular virology. And if the stories are true, he's also totally insane. Rebecca looked back at the list, her stomach a laden knot. Dr. Griffith's still alive and involved with Umbrella. Could today possibly get any worse? What can you tell us about him? David asked. Rebecca's mouth felt dry. She reached for a glass of water and drained it before looking at David. How much do you know about the study of viruses? She asked. He smiled a little. Nothing. That's why I'm here. Rebecca nodded, trying to think of where to start. Okay, viruses are classified by the replication strategy and by the type of nucleic acid in the virion. That's the specialized element in a virus that allows it to transfer its genome to another living cell. A genome is a single, simple set of chromosomes. According to the Baltimore classification, there are seven distinct type of viruses, and each group infects certain organisms in a certain way. In the early 60s, a young scientist at a private university in California challenged the theory, insisting that there was an eighth group, one based loosely on DSDNA and SSDNA viruses, that could infect everything it contacted. It was Dr. Griffith. He published several papers, and while it turned out that he was wrong, his reasoning was brilliant. I know, I read them. The scientific community scoffed at his theory, but his research on virus-specified inclusion bodies in the cytoplasm without a linear genome? 
Rebecca trailed off, noticing the blank expressions on their faces. Sorry. Anyway, Griffith stopped trying to prove the theory, but a lot of people were interested to see what he'd come up with next. Jill interrupted, frowning. Where'd you learn all this? In school. One of my professors was kind of a science history buff. His specialty was defunct theories and scandals. So what happened? David asked. The next time anyone heard from Griffith, it was because he'd gotten kicked out of the university. Dr. Vox, that was my professor, told us that Griffith was officially fired for using drugs, methamphetamines, but the rumor was that he'd been experimenting with drug-induced behavior modification on a couple of his students. Neither of them would talk, but one of them ended up in an asylum and the other eventually committed suicide. Nothing was ever proved, but after that, no one would hire him. And as far as the facts goes, that's the last anyone heard of Nicholas Griffith. But there's more to the story? David asked. Rebecca nodded slowly. In the mid-80s, a private lab in Washington was broken into by cops, and the bodies of three men were found, all dead of a phylovirus infection. It was Marburg, one of the most lethal viruses there is. They'd been dead for weeks, and neighbors had complained because of the smell. The papers the police found in the lab suggest that all three men were research assistants to a Dr. Nicholas Dunn, and that they'd allowed themselves to be deliberately infected with what they understood to be a harmless cold virus. Dr. Dunn was going to see if he could cure it, she stood up, crossing her arms tightly. The agony those men must have endured, she'd seen pictures of Marburg victims. From the initial headache to extreme amplification in a matter of days, fever, clotting, shock, brain damage, massive hemorrhaging from every orifice, they would have died in pools of their own blood. And your professor thought it was Griffith? Jill asked softly. Rebecca forced the images away and turned to Jill, finishing the story the way Dr. Vox had. Griffith's mother, her maiden name was done. Barry let out a low whistle as Jill and Chris exchanged a worried look. David was studying her intently, his gaze cool and unreadable. All the same, she thought she knew what was going through his mind. He's wondering if this changes things. If I'll go with him to see this Caliban Co. facility, now that I know it's being run by people like Griffith. Rebecca looked away from David's intense scrutiny and saw that the rest of her team was watching her, their faces tight with concern. Since that terrible night at the Spencer estate, they'd become like a family to her. She didn't want to leave to risk never seeing them again. But David's right, without the support of the stars, nowhere will be safe for any of us. And this would be my chance to contribute, to do what I'm good at. She wanted to believe that it was the only reason, that she'd be going to fight the good fight, but she couldn't help the tiny shiver of excitement that ran through her at the thought of getting her hands on the T-virus. It would be a golden opportunity to study the mutagen before anyone else, to categorize the effects and pick apart the virion right down to its smallest capsid. Rebecca took a deep breath and blew it out. Her decision made. I'll do it, she said. When do we go? Jill felt her heart quicken at Rebecca's words, a feeling that things were happening too fast and that they weren't prepared. Her decision seemed sudden, even though Jill really hadn't doubted that she'd volunteer. Rebecca was a lot stronger than she looked. She glanced around Barry's wide open living room, discreetly noting the reactions of her teammates. Chris's face was strained, his mouth drawn as he stared absently at the map of Caliban Cove. While Barry walked across to one of the living room windows, staring out past the curtain and scowling at nothing in particular. They're worried about her, and maybe they should be. Griffith sounds like a serious psycho, but would any of us have hesitated if we'd been asked to go? It just proved that Rebecca was as committed as they were. Also, no great surprise. Getting to know the young Bravo had been one of the only bright spots in the frustrating day since the mansion had burned. The girl had been unfailingly optimistic about their chances against Umbrella, even after their suspension, and had worked tirelessly to keep all their spirits up. She was brilliant too, and yet she never flaunted it or came across as condescending when she was attempting to discuss aspects of the T-Virus with them. Rebecca looked a bit distraught herself, glancing around at the three men in the room. Even David Trapp seemed vaguely uncomfortable with her decision, probably because of Rebecca's youth. Men, she's young, she's cute, and she's undoubtedly smarter than all of us put together, but the young and cute part tends to make them overlook the rest. Jill caught her eye and smiled encouragingly. At Rebecca's age, Jill had been a professional thief, and a good one. She was worried about Rebecca too, but only because she'd grown to care about her. The fact that she was a young woman wasn't a reason to underestimate her talents. Rebecca smiled back and walked over to sit by her as David nodded hesitantly at his newest teammate. All right then, good. There's a plane leaving for Bangor at 2300 hours, with a connecting flight to a field just outside of Exeter. 
I thought we could all go over a bit of strategy here, and then drop by your place on the way to the airfield so you can pack a few things. Rebecca nodded, and after cracking a window open, Barry moved back to join them, leaning against one arm of the couch. He folded his arms across his massive chest and jerked his chin toward David. You're the strategist, he said, not unkindly. Why don't you start us off? The respect between the two men was obvious, making Jill like David all the more. In spite of Barry's screw-ups in the Spencer fiasco, Jill had grown to trust him, something she didn't do easily, and he seemed confident in David Trapp's skills. I don't mean to take over, David said, but I have a few thoughts on how we might approach this situation. I've known about the star's betrayal for several days now. Though I thought we might all spend a few moments considering our course of action, I realize this must come as quite a shock. Jill picked up on the same thread of bitterness she'd noticed earlier, on the word betrayal. The fact that the stars were in bed with Umbrella obviously wasn't sitting too well with Mr. Trap. Probably not with Chris or Barry either. Both of them have more time invested with the stars than me or Becca. Jill was disappointed and angry that the stars had sold out, but it wasn't going to be a factor in her decision to work at bringing Umbrella down. Her path had been determined on the day that the McGee sisters had been brutally murdered. The two little girls were the first innocent victims of the T-virus spill at the Spencer estate, and they'd been her friends. She pushed the thoughts away, focusing on the matter at hand. Without the stars, their job was going to be a lot tougher. Not impossible, but she had to admit to herself that their chance of success had just dropped to somewhere near zero. It was a good thing she didn't mind being the underdog. It doesn't matter anyway. Umbrella's gonna pay for what they've done one way or the other. Barry's gruff voice broke the quiet in the room, his gaze thoughtful. Maybe we should go to the press, not local, but someone big, national. David sighed, shaking his head. I thought of that. It's a good idea, but right now, we don't have the proof to make anything stick. Yeah, but at least Umbrella wouldn't move on us with everyone watching. We couldn't count on that, Jill said. If they got to the stars, they can get to anyone, and without evidence, well, you gotta admit, the story is the kind of thing even the tabloids wouldn't buy. There was a moment of sullen silence as if her words reminded them all of how insane it sounded. How insane it would sound to anyone who hadn't experienced what they'd been through. A virus that accidentally turns people into zombies, being used to create unspeakable monsters as living weapons, invented and then covered up by a major corporation that hires bad scientists to experiment on human beings. All it needs is a Nazi war criminal with an atomic weapon, we'd have a bestseller in our hands. Well, what were we talking about before? Organizing some of the other stars, Chris said. I've got a few people in mind, some of the guys I trained with, and I know Barry's got a lot of contacts. David nodded in agreement. Yes, I think that should be a priority. My concern is how to get in touch with them. The branch offices may already be tapped, and we want to keep Umbrella from learning about our plans for as long as possible. Unfortunately, we won't have use of the star's resources for much longer. Maybe we should go look for a go-between? Jill said slowly. Someone who doesn't have ties to the stars. Chris grinned suddenly. I know a guy from back in the Air Force who works for Jack Hamilton now, one of the section heads for the FBI. I don't know much about Hamilton, but Pete's about as honest as they come, and he owes me a favor. Brilliant, David said. Perhaps you could ask him to help you look into the local police as well. Once we have solid evidence from the main facility, we can go to your friend, instigate a federal investigation. It sounded good, but Jill found herself feeling frustrated by the talk. She wanted to act. Waiting for the stars to contact them had been bad enough. Knowing that Rebecca was going to be risking her life while they waited idly by would be excruciating. You said you had some thoughts about what else we can do, she said. David nodded. Yes, though once we involve the government, it may not come to anything quite so daring. I had been formulating a plan to infiltrate Umbrella Headquarters, a risky proposition at best. It seems wisest to work on a smaller scale for now, but I do believe the three of you should drop out of sight as soon as possible. I also think it'd be prudent for you to see what you can uncover on Mr. Trent though I have the distinct feeling that you won't come up with much, if anything. He smiled a little, and having met Trent, Jill understood his doubts perfectly. Their strange benefactor had struck her as a very careful man. I get the impression that we'll only find what he wants us to find, David continued, but it is worth a look, and we'll need to arrange a rendezvous site after we've... His soft, musical voice broke off suddenly as he tilted his head to one side, listening intently. Jill heard it in the same instant and felt her heart freeze in her chest. A rustling in the bushes outside the window that Barry had opened. Umbrella. Get down, Jill shouted. And rolled off the couch, pulling Rebecca with her as the window shattered. The curtains blown aside in an explosive burst from an automatic rifle. David dove for the floor as bullets riddled the chair he'd been in, already grabbing for his weapon. 
Tufts of padding floated past his wide eyes as a smoking trail of holes tore across the wall. Plaster and wood flying. Bloody hell. There was a split-second break in the onslaught, just long enough for them to hear the crash of glass breaking from the back of the house. Barry, lights, he shouted, but Barry was way ahead of him, the thunder of his Colt revolver drowning out the intermittent spray of the machine gun. The room went dark as Barry's rounds found their mark, glass raining down from above. Light still streamed into the darkness from the hall, and there was another hail of bullets from outside. Chris grabbed on elbows and knees for the hallway and in one smooth movement rolled onto his side and took out the additional lights. The living room was now completely black and the burst of automatic fire stopped. Over the ringing in his ears, David heard boots crunching on glass from back in the kitchen. The heavy steps paused, the intruder probably waiting for the window shooter to catch up. And there will be more than two covering the exits, kitchen door, front porch, someone watching the windows. Another set of steps entered the kitchen. These hurried and shuffling, but they also stopped. The pair was waiting, either for more of their team or for the assembled stars to make a move. David's thoughts raced independently of him, reflexively considering and rejecting theories and options at lightning speed. We get upstairs, we pick them off one at a time, unless they mean to torch the house, so we run straight through them out the back, except they've got the firepower advantage. Maybe spook eyes and we'd be moving targets, no contest. All he knew for certain was that they couldn't stay where they were. There was no cover for when the thugs got tired of waiting. There was shuffling movement from the right as Barry's hulking shadow crouched towards him. David's eyes had adjusted enough to see Jill and Rebecca on the other side of the coffee table. Both of them crouched and holding handguns. He couldn't make Chris out, but he was probably still by the hall. Barry's house was last on the block, a wooded park just passed. If they could slip out, get into the trees, the thought stuck. Even a bad plan was better than none at all, and they didn't have time to work out alternatives. Basement door, David whispered. Barry's gruff voice was soft and restrained. Yeah. No good. It would be posted. They'd have to get out through the second floor. We go through the park, he whispered quickly. Jill, get to Chris and prepare to lay cover on my signal. Barry, Rebecca, as soon as we start, hit the stairs fast to an east window. Soft as jump. We'll follow. Ready? Go. Jill's already moving around the couch, disappearing silently into the thick shadows. Barry and Rebecca right behind. David paused long enough just to scoop up the papers that Trent had given him. He stuffed them inside his shirt. The crinkling pages cool against his sweaty skin. Nothing else in his briefcase would be damaging. He crept toward the yawning blackness of the opening to the hall, edging to where Jill and Chris were crouched. The entry faced the side of the stairs. To the left was the front door and the foot of the steps. To the right, the quiet kitchen at the end of the long hall where the two umbrella operatives waited. They go right, I'll take left. When the shooting begins, the rest of the strike force should rush the front door. David hoped. If the timing wasn't perfect, they were dead. Away from the faint light from the windows, it was too dark for hand signals. He leaned close between Jill and Chris, pitching his voice as low as possible. Both right. Jill low and outside, he whispered. They wouldn't be aiming for the floor, and Chris could use the wall of the entry as a shield. I've got the front door. Keep it up for six seconds, exactly. No more. On zero, you need to be on the stairs, out of the corridor. On my mark, now. The three of them sprang into positions, Chris and Jill firing toward the kitchen, David whirling to the left. He ran for the front door in a low crouch, the count ticking. Five. Four. Behind him, Barry and Rebecca lunged for the stairs to the crash of bullets. David trained the Beretta on the darkness in front of him, and was only a foot away from the door when someone kicked it open. His shoulder connected with the heavy wood, and he threw himself into it, slamming it closed. He dropped to the floor and jammed his heel against the base. Two. He fired into the door in an upward angle, five shots as fast as he could pull the trigger. There was a strangled scream, the sound of something heavy hitting the porch, and he fired three more before rolling to his feet. Into the alcove at the foot of the stairs and out of the line of fire. Their time was up. David spun, saw Jill and Chris already on their way up, and as his feet hit the first riser, there was a sound like an explosion behind him. The front door was suddenly a mass of flying splinters, heavy rounds tearing through the wood as the Umbrella team sought to end the battle. If the two Alphas hadn't killed the men in the kitchen, they were surely dead by now. Halfway up the stairs, David turned and fired twice more through the rapidly disintegrating door, hoping he'd bought the stars enough time to escape. Ten, maybe twenty seconds before they realized we're gone. It was going to be close. Rebecca stood on the dark landing, her heart pounding almost as loudly as the booming shots that chased Jill and Chris up the stairs. Come on, come on. Barry was to her right at the end of the landing's hall, barely visible by the moonlight that streamed through the open window. 
Jill was the first to reach the top. Rebecca steered her toward Barry with a touch, Chris following close behind. The muzzle on David's 9mm flashed brightly in the darkness on the stairs, and then he was in front of her, materializing out of the gloom like a sweaty ghost. This way. Rebecca turned and ran for the window. David at her side. Jill had already gone, and Chris was halfway out, Barry gripping one of his hands as he struggled to balance himself. Please God, let there be a mattress, a pile of leaves. The crash of the front door flying open was followed by heavy footsteps and muffled male voices, angry and commanding. Chris disappeared through the window, and then Barry was reaching for her, his mouth with a grim line. She jammed her pistol back in its holster and stepped to the window, Barry's warm hand on her back. Rebecca crawled onto the sill and looked down. There were hedges against the side of the house, lush and thick and impossibly far below. She caught a glimpse of Jill standing on the lawn, aiming her weapon toward the front of the house, and Chris looking up at them, don't think, just do it. Rebecca slid out the window, Barry's strong fingers finding her hand. Her shoulder groaned as gravity did its work. Barry leaning out to give her less of a drop, her body suspended in midair. He let go, and before she could feel real terror, she hit the bushes. There was a small pain, twigs and branches scratching at her bare legs, and then Chris was pulling her out, lifting her easily from the twinning hedges. Take the back, he breathed, his attention already fixed back on the window. Rebecca snatched the revolver out as she stepped onto the lawn, turning to face the shadows that made up the backyard. To her left, a dark strand of trees stood, maybe there 20 meters away, silent and still. Hurry, hurry. There was a thundering rattle of bullets inside the house and a thrashing thump in the bushes to her right, but she didn't turn, intent on her assigned task. A movement by the corner of the house. Rebecca didn't hesitate, sending two shots into the thickening of shadow, Barry's 38 jerking in her hands. The figure crumpled, falling forward just enough for her to see that she'd hit a man clutching a rifle and that he wasn't going to get up again. Never shot anybody before. Move, Chris shouted, and Rebecca jerked her head around. Saw Barry climb out of the bushes and stumble towards them. There was a shout from the window, followed by a burst from an automatic rifle. Rebecca actually felt the bullets hit the ground near her feet, tearing up chunks of overgrown lawn. Dirt pelted her legs. Shit. David and Jill fired back as they ran for the trees, Chris leading the way. The shooter either ducked or was shot. The dull clatter of the rifle fell silent. As they reached the first of the wooded shadows, Rebecca heard the wail of approaching sirens, followed closely by shouts and running steps across Barry's front porch. Seconds later, there was a squeal of tires. Rebecca stumbled, dodging between narrow, gnarled trunks, trying to keep the others in sight. The revolver felt too heavy in her slick grasp, and her entire body seemed to be pounding, her legs shaking, her breathing sharp and shallow. Everything had happened so fast. She'd known they were in danger that Umbrella wanted them out of the way, but knowing something wasn't the same as really believing it, as believing that violent strangers could break into Barry's home and try to take their lives, and I may have taken one of theirs instead. The thought that she might have killed someone, she forced it away before it could take hold, concentrating on the pale shape of Chris's t-shirt ahead. Her conscience would have to wait until she had time to think it through. Ahead of them, the thick woods opened into a clearing, playground equipment gleaming dully in the pallid light. Chris slowed to a jog and then stopped where the line of trees ended, turning back to search the shadows for the rest of them. Rebecca caught up to him, Barry and Jill just behind her, all of them breathing heavily and looking as stunned and sober as Rebecca felt. David, where's David? Chris gasped, and they all turned, straining to see past the dark, reaching branches. Rebecca saw one of the shadows to their left move, a stealthy, sliding movement. Look out! She grabbed to the ground even as she yelled, fresh terror surging through her system, and the shadow fired at them, twice. The shots muted compared to the explosive thunder at the house. There was a third shot, louder, closer, and the shadow stumbled and fell, crashing against the tree before collapsing silently to the dirt. Except for the rising moan of sirens, the park was again still. Rebecca slowly raised her head, craning to look over her shoulder, and saw David standing, still pointing his Beretta at the fallen shooter. Jill and Chris were crouched next to her, both of them holding their weapons out, staring around them with a wide, searching gaze. And on her other side, Barry was sprawled on the ground, his face pressed to the blanket of dried pine needles and long dead leaves. He wasn't moving. Make sure you join me next time for the Tales of Resident Evil, Part 2, where we'll continue the story of Caliban Cove, starting with Chapter 4.